But if you remember nothing of what I say whatsoever, remember this. San Francisco is not broke. Oakland is not broke. San Jose is not broke. Richmond is not broke. Alameda County is not broke. Contra Costa County is not broke. California is not broke. America is not broke. This is the richest country in the world. We have massive resources. We are not broke. What we've got is a broken politics that redistributes the wealth upwards rather than putting the wealth where it belongs with working people in this country. And let me tell you, let me tell you just how not broke we are. Because I don't think you hear this enough. I mean, if, no matter, I mean, even in the labor movement, the labor movement, we are not told as often as we should be how rich we are. There's a group called the Tax Justice Foundation, Tax Justice Network. It's an international group. And what they do is they look at where the money is. They recently hired one of the top corporate economists in the world. And you know, they gave this guy a whole bunch of money and they said, Figure out how much money is in Mitt Romney's tax shelter. Figure out how much money there is in the Cayman Islands and in Switzerland, and not just for Mitt, but for all these folks. How much money have they sheltered? Because you understand what a tax shelter is. Do you know what a, you know what a rain shelter is? Right? You're waiting for the bus. You step into that shelter. You don't get rained on. When you step into the tax shelter, you don't get taxed. And so when somebody takes their money and puts it in the tax shelter, they don't pay taxes. What that means is that every penny that goes into a Cayman Islands tax shelter, a Swiss tax shelter, a tax shelter anywhere, in the world, every penny that goes in there, those are resources that ought to be legally, morally, structurally in San Francisco and San Jose and Oakland and Contra Costa County. Ought to be in those places, but no, no, no. It gets taken out and put away. How much money? This guy studied, they studied the whole world. They looked at, this is a very serious economist. The guy's a conservative. No, it's not some radical. 21 trillion, with a T, 21 trillion dollars is sheltered from taxation Right now, $21 trillion. So the next time somebody comes to you and says, you know, we really don't have, we're just broke. We don't have money. It's, with all due respect, we, nobody's broke. We got money, we have money like we don't know what to do with. The problem is we don't know how to get at it. Trillions and trillions of dollars put out there that if we just used it, for rational, necessary purposes, we would pay our workers, every worker. Nobody would ever get a minimum wage in this country because there's nothing more immoral than the concept of a minimum wage, right? That's a, do you know minimum wage in this country is poverty? No, we would have a living wage in America. Everyone would be guaranteed a living wage because that's what a moral country does. You don't have a minimum wage, you have a living wage. There would be so many other things that we could do without a challenge. Let me give you a couple examples because when people tell you that, they're, that we're broke, you should understand this. You understand, oh, well, we're so broke we're going to have to take away Social Security, right? Paul Ryan. Although I will, I will suggest to you that, that with all due respect, Paul Ryan uh, is, is probably as good a bogeyman as we've ever had. Uh, you know, they, it's, it's worked out well to illustrate the crisis. But, um, if you happen to be in the 47% that actually needs money, um, it, so they want to take away 47. They want to take away Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Do you understand? How, how do we fix Social Security? How would we possibly? Geez, I don't know. What would we do to fix Social Security? I've got an idea. Why don't we make everybody pay the same percentage into Social Security that a working person has to pay? Why don't we say, you know, you go across the bay right now, Oracle's got all of its rich people over there, right? Fabulous. Love them. Great. I'm glad they're in town. Why doesn't, 
why don't the executives of Oracle have to pay the same percentage of their income into Social Security as you do? If they did, Social Security would be fully funded throughout the future of the Republic. There would never be a Social Security problem in this country. So we have, do you want to know how you make Medicare and Medicaid work now? You take those programs, you take the Veterans Administration, you take all the other health care programs that we've got, you combine them into a Medicare for all single payer system and we cut our medical costs in half and ensure that everybody has access to care. You say, well, you know, Mr. Nichols, those are unrealistic thoughts, right? You can't, how could you possibly do that? Well, you know that vir virtually every other functional country in the world does. We're the one, we're the outlier on this thing. And you say, well, yeah, but still, you know, I'm a little worried about the money thing. Where are we going to find our resources? It's a little thought. You say, this woman sitting over here, I love her, by the way. She, she's, she's sitting over here, she's typing away, going, tax the rich. <laughs> Make them pay their taxes. I love that. But you know what? We don't even have to tax the rich as much as I would like to tax them. All we got to do, all we have to do is put a financial transactions tax on every transaction that is done. Now, I'm not talking about your grandma selling her AT&T stock. I'm talking about when big traders move money back and forth, because that's where our economy is today. That what we do do in this country is move paper. We move commodities, stocks, bonds. We don't tax it the way that we do production in this country. If we simply taxed those transfers of paper back and forth with a micro tax, Congressman Keith Ellison of Minnesota last week introduced a financial transactions tax proposal. Micro tax so small it wouldn't even be noted. It's just in the computer programs as they move it, raises half a trillion dollars a year. $500 million a year, and they wouldn't even notice it. That's what you need to understand. We're not broke. We're not broke. But we have broken politics. And why do we have broken politics? It's pretty simple to answer. When the trade union movement in this country was at its strongest point in the 1950s, we taxed wealthy people at 90% of their income. And you know what happened? We still had rich people who lived in houses up on the hill, and you know what they did? They invested because they didn't want to be taxed. And so they actually built things and made things. Organized labor has to be on the march politically, advancing new ideas and fighting to make things happen, not just trying to keep what it's got. But when you beat the hell out of labor for 30 years, it's got to go to a defensive position. And that's the history of what's going on right now. We have great ideas, ideas that would solve our problems, but they're not on the table because unions are forced to defend their pay, their wages, their benefits, fighting in San Jose for your pensions. I mean, you can't go out and solve all the problems of the world because you've got to solve your own problems. I understand that. But you have to also understand what the fights are about. Right now, in this country, we have restructured our campaign finance system so that billionaires can spend whatever they want. Right? They can just free reign. Millionaires can spend whatever they want, not as much as a billionaire, but you know, they can aspire. And corporations can spend whatever they want. They can just open up the corporate treasury and put it in, into our politics. And so we've restructured it. Do you understand how bad it is? They took a functional incompetent named Mitt Romney and they bought him the nominee of a major political party in this country. That's insane. But I say to my Republican friends, if you didn't have this horrible campaign finance system, you might have a chance. You might have nominated a competent candidate, but you don't because the corruption, the evil of campaign finance is it pushes down sub-choices upon us. The worst of the worst. The only qualification you have to run for President of the United States is if you can raise money or if you can move money around. That is not a qualification to rule the most powerful country in the world. And so, the system is very screwed up. And yet, as screwed up as it is, that's not enough. They can't even win when they have more money. And so what do you do in a situation like that? If you're out spending 19 to 1, go after the 1. Go after the $1 that can beat your $19. 
Go, if you're getting out spending them 10 to 1, go after the one that can beat your 10. And that's what's going on across America right now. We have the most militant effort in the history of the republic to shut down the ability of the trade union movement to get its $1 together and beat their $19. That is the history of the last several years in this country. And if we're going to fight a fight, let us fight the fight to keep our voice in the politics of this country so that we can push them back and beat them in election after election. That's got to be what we're fighting for. In my home state of Wisconsin, they came for us. They came for the trade union movement, and the governor got rid of collective bargaining. Why did he get rid of collective bargaining? Well, we have, we have one of the smallest numbers of public, sectors of public sector workers of any state in the North. We are not a heavily, we are not heavily uh, employed state. We are, don't have overly highly paid public employees. They get a decent compensation, but we're not that expensive a place to live. It's not San Francisco. And, <laughs> And so why were they going after the unions? Why were they taking away collective bargaining rights? Very simple answer. In the northern tier states of the United States, coming out of the Great Lakes and into Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, places like that, the only entity with enough resources to challenge corporate power, the only entity with enough resources to come into the public sphere and push back public sector unions. And Public sector unions, you say, oh, well, they're just taking care of themselves. Well, I hope so. I hope my kid's teacher is taking care of herself so that she's got enough pay and enough benefits so she can come in well-rested and ready to teach my kid every day. I hope public sector workers take care of themselves. I hope the snowplow drivers take care of themselves so that they can come and plow the road so I can go to work in the morning. I like it when public sector workers take care of themselves. But that's not what Scott Walker was worried about. What he was worried about was that public sector workers were bringing their resources together, going into the politics of Wisconsin and other states. And when they did so, they pushed back and they defended public services. They defended the commons. They defended those things we do together. Because if you shut down the public sector unions, do you know what you get to do? Government itself becomes dysfunctional. There's no defender of government left. Do you think politicians are going to get up there and say, oh, yeah, we're for taxes, we're for resources, we're for infrastructure? They won't do it. The only reason they'll do it is if there's public sector unions that go into the fight and make the case on television, on radio, using the resources of their members to talk about why we need a commons in this country, why we need public services in this country. So if they shut it down, government becomes dysfunctional, and you know what happens then? Privatization, right? You can buy the Golden Gate Bridge. You can buy a waterworks. Do you know the Koch brothers actually run waterworks? They run power plants. They would love to buy power plants for inexpensive amounts. So this is what happens. This is what the fight is about in this country. It is very, very rich people seeking to create a political system where they've got nobody to push back against them. So we know, we know full well that, of course, an effort to protect the collective bargaining rights of public sector workers would be in bad shape. No, we put it on the ballot in Ohio. 61% of Ohioans voted for labor rights. 82 of 88 counties. John Boehner's home district voted to protect the rights of workers to organize. So, brothers and sisters, we're winning all over. But now I got a little problem. Because California is such a big deal, right? <laughs> Oh, yeah, everybody lives in California, you know, and you got Hollywood and San Francisco. And what you guys do, you know, California gets a cold, the rest of the country has the flu, right? So what you do matters. And your billionaires have decided to put Proposition 32 on the ballot. Nice hiss. You're getting up there. Good. I like that. Do you understand that Proposition 32 is exactly the same as what Walker did? Proposition 32 is exactly the same as what John Kasich did. It is exactly the same strategy. The strategy is not to worry about wages, benefits, and pensions. That's, that you get once you get rid of the political power. Proposition 32 is 
a struggle on the part of the wealthiest people in California and America. Because remember, the Koch brothers, they've come here as well. Wealthiest people in America have come here for the purpose of making sure that your unions are not functional, that they cannot have a voice in our political life. And you understand what happens if Proposition 32 passes. If it passes here, you will see a rapid transition of California politics. The wealthy will be able to buy elections because, yes, it is true that Meg Whitman might outspend you 19 to 1 and you still beat her, but when you take away the one, she wins. When you shut down the unions as a political voice, they win. And it, isn't even, it doesn't even matter whether they win as Republicans or Democrats because if the money is there and the unions are not a voice in our politics, then even Democrats will begin to reflect what the money says. And so in very rapid order, California changes, but so does America. This model legislation from California will become the model across the country. And so you're not in a fight for yourselves on Proposition 32. I wish you were, and I want you to protect yourselves. You are in a fight for the future of the republic. This country cannot survive without strong and functional unions. And your fight on Proposition 32 is exactly the same as the fight in Wisconsin, the fight in Ohio. Don't, don't lose sight of this. Don't lose sight of this. You must win. You must win. Not for yourselves, but if you fail, if you fail on Proposition 32, we will see a massive assault on the public sector. And that massive assault, there's a wonderful poster in Wisconsin. It summed up everything we fought about there. It, was a, it had a little girl, and she was holding up um, you know, her, uh, her lunch tray from school. And she was looking up and she said, Mama, the governor says the rich man needs my lunch money. That's what we're fighting about. It is, we are fighting about a redistribution of the wealth upward, where they would take a child's lunch money, where they would take food stamp money and move it up the ladder to the wealthiest people in America, and where they would privatize our basic services our basic services so that they can make a few more dollars. That's what Proposition 32 is about. It is not about campaign contributions. It is not about politics. It is not about unions. It is not about billionaires. It is about a basic fundamental question of a humane society. Will you have someone, some group of people, who can pool their resources and come into the political fight and say, no, no, we aren't going to give away everything that we've fought for and built. We are going to make a civil society. We're going to make sure that that child has her lunch money. We're going to make sure that the police officer and the firefighter has the resources to do their job. We're going to make sure that architectures, architects and engineers and public employees across all of the different sectors are well compensated, that they have decent pay, decent benefits, decent pensions, because that is part of the infrastructure of a civil society. And so, brothers and sisters, I will tell you this. It's a simple message. Simple message. Mitt Romney is going to get beaten on November 6th. He is going to lose, partially because he's just fundamentally incompetent as a human being. <laughs> but, but if Mitt Romney loses and Proposition 32 wins, we've suffered a worse setback than the reverse. Because if Proposition 32 wins in California, you will send a wave across this country that will swamp the public sector and that will ultimately deconstruct everything that is good and functional about America. And so I don't want to put any pressure on you. <laughs> but I come from Wisconsin where we have fought great battles and put hundreds of thousands of people in the street and where we have held the line for 18 months against the austerity agenda and the cuts and we are winning in Wisconsin, but we need you to win in California. You must defeat Proposition 32. It is the ultimate act of solidarity, not just for yourselves, but for workers and for citizens across this republic. Solidarity, brothers and sisters. I stand with you, and I want you to win.